I'm going to talk today about uh, economic growth. Uh, I want to talk about uh, empirical patterns, uh, partly in terms of long-term uh, growth for uh, one or several countries, and partly I'm going to think about it in terms of a cross-section of countries covering most uh, of the world. And then I'm going to try to put these empirical patterns uh, to some extent uh, in the context of uh, economic theory, particularly about uh, models of uh, economic growth, but I'll be limited how far I can do that, I think, uh, uh, today. Um, so these are just some quick numbers about the U.S. Uh, economy, which is one of the uh, places where you can get very long-term national accounts uh, data. Uh, so think of all these numbers as being in real per capita terms, referring to the gross domestic product. Uh, so if you look just after the end of the U.S. Civil War, uh, it's about $3,000 per person, in some sense uh, being measured uh, hopefully accurately over a century and a half. Um, so this is in 2011 U.S. dollars, but that doesn't make too much difference. Uh, so a recent number for that, uh, here for 2014, was about $52,000. So uh, it's a little bit higher than that if you look today in the U.S., but that's the right order of magnitude. And if you ask what was the average annual growth rate over this whole uh, long period of more than 140 years, uh, the answer is about 2% per year. And somehow in terms of these numbers, the number 2% uh, comes up uh, quite a bit. But it's uh, in particular the average per capita growth rate for the U.S. And actually for the U.S., unlike a lot of other economies, it doesn't have any particular trend in it. Uh, it looks like 2% per year for a lot of different periods that you might uh, uh, want to look at. Uh, there are two kinds of contexts where you can look at plentiful data to think about uh, economic growth at the macroeconomic uh, level. So one is in the relatively recent period, uh, particularly going back to 1960 and for 1950 for some subset of countries. There you would have data for more than 100 countries, uh, depending on what other information you want. If you just wanted the gross domestic product, you could get well over 100 uh, countries where you have data. Um, there's so-called pen world tables, which people uh, use a lot. Um, Larry Summers' father, Bob Summers, was actually heavily involved with uh, creating this uh, data set. Uh, the current version of these data is Penn World Tables number nine, which is probably uh, better. This is an earlier version of the data that I'm discussing here. Uh, but with these data, you can look uh, at a point in time uh, or across time from, say, 1960 to today uh, for this group of countries. And this is just telling you something about what the range is in terms of real per capita GDP. Uh, here I looked at a recent year, which was 2009. I'm going to look at these data uh, somewhat more. Um, in that year, the United States was number 11. If you looked earlier, the U.S. would have been number one or number two, but by 2009, the U.S. was only around number uh, 11. Uh, the richest country in terms of per capita GDP is Qatar, which is um, a country with not too much population and a lot of oil, so you might not think that's too interesting from an economic uh, perspective. Uh, but you can see uh, Norway, for example, is the richest among the OECD countries, basically a combination of an oil country and an OECD country. Uh, and Singapore is also very uh, uh, rich. So that's one kind of frame you can look at if you're trying to study economic growth. You can look at lots of countries since roughly 1960, where you'd also have a lot of other information about what's going on in each economy. There are a lot of things that you have measurements of uh, over that time frame. A second perspective you can take is to try to look uh, more long term. So going back for over a century, um, my former student Jose Ursua was able to uh, assemble annual data for 42 countries back before World War I. So that means starting uh, 1913 or, soon, or earlier, uh, going back to 1870 for many of these uh, economies. Uh, so that's a smaller data set in terms of numbers of countries, but a much longer time frame. Uh, you would also have less information available on other variables if you're trying to look at what determines economic growth, but on the other hand, you have this much longer time frame. So this is just one example of one of these long histories, which is the U.S. data. In this case, you can go back before 1800 with some uh, 
imperfect measurement. Uh, people often look, do I have a pointer here or no? Thank you. People often look from the end of the uh, US Civil War. The blue graph is real per capita gross domestic product. People often look from around there going out over time. Um, the remarkable thing about the U.S., which I think people have made too much about because I think it ends up being an accident, uh, is if you look at this whole period from here out at least to the year 2000 or so, uh, if you put a ruler along that graph, the amazing thing is the same slope would work at the beginning, let's say 1870, all the way out to at least uh, 2000. So it looked like for the U.S., this is all on a proportionate scale, that there was one long-run growth rate and one associated level, which looked like some kind of potential per capita GDP, some kind of a trend, uh, to which the actual data were always reverting. It looked like there was this fixed trend, but I wouldn't get too excited about that, even though it's mentioned a lot in the economics literature, because it doesn't seem to work for any other country. And I don't think it works in the U.S. actually at the end. It looks like the growth rate has started to slow down after the year 2000 which is, of course, just very recently. Uh, so you can think about this in terms of the long-run average rate of growth, which I already mentioned was about 2% per year. That was from the numbers I showed previously. Uh, you can look at some of the major downturns and upticks. Uh, the big negative event for the U.S. is the Great Depression from 1929 to 33. Um, so this is one of these macro disaster events that I'll probably discuss more uh, on Wednesday. Uh, for the U.S., this is a decline by about 29% in per capita GDP over a four-year period, which is extremely large, of course, although not the biggest in history by any means. Um, following the Great Depression, there's actually a very rapid recovery. People often have the mistaken impression that from 1933 on that the U.S. economy didn't grow until World War II. That's actually uh, mistaken. The growth rate is actually very rapid before World War II. But then for the U.S., which is quite unlike a lot of other economies, the U.S. grew dramatically during World War II. World War II is actually the biggest negative macro disaster event uh, in the global history that we have the data for. But the U.S. looks different from most places, and the U.S. did very well during that period in terms of GDP growth. And then there's a... Uh, 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 demobilization after the war, which is what this negative thing is, and then it just so happens, this is what the magical thing is in this period, it comes back to the same trend line that was true over here, and I think that that's an accident. It's a, quite a remarkable uh, random set of events. Uh, you have this picture for 42 countries I mentioned before, I'm not going to go through them of course. This is the United Kingdom. Uh, Germany is interesting because it experienced all the big macro disaster events of the 20th century. So if you look at uh, Germany, this is the GDP is the blue. World War I is a big negative event for Germany, which didn't really affect the United States very much. Uh, so that's this uh, contraction, which is more than 30% in per capita GDP. Uh, Germany also had a hyperinflation after World War I, which peaked in 1923. And that's this negative part here. Uh, then there's the Great Depression, which also affected Germany, though not proportionately as much as the United States. Um, Germany then grows very rapidly, including through much of World War II, until roughly the end of 1944, 19, beginning of 1945. And then this is the biggest macro disaster event of the whole data set. This is uh, pretty much... Uh, Late 1944 through early 1946, there's a decline by 70% in per capita GDP, which is quite remarkable. And of course, you might worry about exactly how the measurements are being done, which is another question. But there's no doubt that there was a big macro disaster event for Germany. And then following that, there's a pretty rapid growth rate, the famous German miracle recovery after World War II. And then you can see that the growth rate is gradually diminishing in this period and getting very flat toward the end where there's not too much economic growth. Um, so there are other cases, this is Japan, um, 
China was a case where my student, uh, Jose Ursua, spent a lot of time. It was a big challenge trying to assemble a meaningful long-term series for China, and I think he was uh, successful in that. I might say it's a great disappointment in my life that Jose, after doing all this work, decided to take a job at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I was a little uh, disturbed about that, but uh, we're still friends anyway. Um, Anyway, uh, you can see the great leap forward and the cultural revolution weren't really such good ideas in terms of the measurement of per capita GDP. Uh, and actually the period from the late 1970s on, China has the fastest growth rate among all the countries being considered. That wasn't true until they more or less were no longer a communist state starting roughly in the uh, end of the 1970s. But the growth rate has been quite impressive there. Um, I wrote an article recently predicting that the growth rate would have to go down a lot soon, and I think there's a lot of consensus about that being uh, accurate, but you can, uh, the slope here is very steep, indicating that uh, there was very rapid growth for a long period for China. Uh, the Russian case was also a big challenge, uh, I won't try to go through that here. Um, this is the experience, if you take this so-called rich countries club, uh, the OECD countries, which is particularly Western Europe and the United States and Japan and, and, and so on. Um, these are the average growth rates of real per capita GDP over 20 year periods going back to 1820. At the beginning of the sample, you don't have too many countries. Uh, later on, you have uh, basically the 17 countries being represented here. Uh, the average growth rate here over the long term is again this 2% per year number for per capita real GDP. That's the average growth rate over the long term. It looks like there's been a slowdown, as with the United States, since roughly 2000. It looks like the growth rate is lower than it has been historically, but it's not that long a time frame that you have in order to make that judgment. But it, it seems plausible that the growth rate is lower than it has been on average in the previous uh, uh, decades. Um, Here's one way to think about the long-term growth rate, which uh, applying it uh, to the United States. So if you go back to this comparison of the levels of per capita product, uh, let's say in 1869 and a later year, 2014, that's what I looked at uh, at the beginning. Uh, the comparison between those two levels is a factor of 16. That's how much you manage to increase some measure of prosperity per capita product, per capita income, over a period of more than 140 years. That's what corresponds to growing at 2% uh, per year. Um, one way to think about those numbers, uh, I don't know whether this is familiar or unfamiliar, uh, there's this famous rule of 69, which arises because the natural log of two is 0.69. Uh, you can ask the question, how long does it take you to double your per capita output? Um, so if you're growing at some rate, let's say G, if you're growing at some rate G uh, here in percent per year, well, if you divide that into 69, you get the answer, 35 years it takes you to double. Uh, of course, if you were growing twice as fast, if you were growing at 4% per year rather than 2%, then the answer would be half as much, 17 and a half years rather than 35. But if you think about growing per capita at 2% per year, which was true for the US and also on average for those OECD countries, then it takes you 35 years to double where you're at. So if you ask the question, over 140 years, how much are you gonna increase your standard of living measured by per capita GDP, uh, well, over 140 years, you can think about how many times did you accomplish 35 years, and the answer to that is four times, 35, 70, yeah, 140. So you're going to double uh, four times, and that's where you get the factor of 16. So if you, you want to make a quick comparison of the end year, 2014, with the beginning year, which was 1869, and it's a factor of 16, that's because you doubled four times. Uh, and that's how you increase by a factor of 16, and that corresponds to growing at 2% per year. So those are what the numbers look like uh, 
apply to the U.S., but it would also apply to other countries that were growing uh, similarly. So now I want to take a look at a broad cross-section of countries at particular points in time. So this comes from this Penn World Tables type data that I referred to earlier. Uh, the World Bank now puts out similar data. This was initiated in this Penn World Table project uh, quite a long time ago now, about over 30 years ago. Um, so now you can get similar data from the, uh, from the World Bank. Uh, one feature of these data, which I'm not really going to go into a lot right now, is it makes these purchasing power adjustments to try to compare real income or real GDP across countries. So you ask the question, how much income do you need in a particular country to buy a designated market basket of goods? And then you try to make those comparisons across countries. That, that was the major innovation behind this Penn World Tables. So these are often called purchasing power parity uh, adjustments, which is a procedure that was adopted by the World Bank. And you can see those data now uh, in the World Bank in their uh, uh, World Tables. Okay, so let me try to look at a, uh, particular dates. Um, so here I was looking at 2009 as the particular date. You could update this now to 2015 uh, with these data, but you'd get a similar uh, story. Um, there's a tremendous range across the 180 countries with these data in terms of the per capita product. Um, so these are these numbers I mentioned before. Uh, Qatar was the richest place, $159,000 per person. Uh, Zimbabwe, which used to be a fairly well-off country actually in Africa, uh, was estimated at being below $200 per person. So that's an incredible factor of over a thousand in terms of the difference in the levels. Uh, so if you don't care about small oil countries, you might want to compare, for example, Zimbabwe with the United States. And at that time, it was a factor of about 300 in terms of the difference in per capita product. So one way to think about that is that in, in 140 years, the US managed to increase its per capita product by a factor of 16. Right? It took 140 years to do that. But now, if you're looking across countries, say Zimbabwe versus the US, it's a factor of almost 300. And Think about that in the context of what the U.S. was able to accomplish uh, in 140-something years. And if you're trying to ask, what does a poor country do to try to get up to the rich countries? And having to make up a factor of 300, um, that's pretty much of an impossible task, but it's an order of magnitude different from what the U.S. accomplished in well over a century. Um, so let me look at this picture here. Uh, so this is a picture showing per capita GDP across the 100 plus countries with the data uh, in the year 2009. So as I mentioned, uh, this is the range. So Zimbabwe is down here. This is a proportionate scale for per capita GDP in 2009. Uh, Qatar is uh, the richest place, but if you don't like that, you can look at places like Norway, Singapore, uh, Australia, et cetera, the United States, uh, in terms of levels of per capita GDP applying to the year 2009. Israel's in this group here. Uh, so this is uh, some years ago. Uh, Israel's more like 35, 37,000, I think now. Uh, but this was the year 2009. So at that point, Israel was in a group that included Italy, South Korea, Spain, and so on. Right. So you can think about this as a uh, diagram showing the world distribution of income per person. It's all per capita. But this is a, uh, weighting each country the same. So we have each country here appearing once. And we're counting countries kind of the same and thinking about the world distribution of income, which means that larger countries with more population are being counted in an equal way with smaller countries, which may not be the way you want to think about it. For some purposes, this is a good way to think about it. And for some ways, it's not such a good idea. But try to illustrate that. Um, 
But this is telling you about the world distribution of income at a point in time at the country level. So it's telling you something about what the average is, which is somewhere here in the middle. And it's telling you how much of a spread there is, or what kind of variance there is across countries in terms of per capita GDP. So that's a picture as a snapshot at one point in time. You could go back now to an earlier year. So I'm going to use 1960, which is the first year where you have data for lots of countries. So there are 113 countries with the data in 1960. Uh, the range between the poorest and the richest at that date was not as great as it turned out to be in 2009. So in 1960, the poorest country in this group was Tanzania. It's about $400. These numbers are all in real terms. These are 2005 US dollars, it just so happens. Uh, the richest country in 1960 was Switzerland, uh, almost 16,000. And the United States at that point was second at 13,000. Um, if you look at the factor comparing the richest and the poorest place, in 1960 that was about 40, 39. And that's increased substantially. That is, the spread between the poorest and the richest country has risen dramatically after the roughly 50 years after 1960. Uh, so if you look at that picture, that's this diagram. So this is the same kind of distributional diagram for per capita GDP across countries, but applying in 1960 rather than a recent year, which was 2009. And you can see the range from Tanzania to Switzerland. Um, if you ask what's happened to the world distribution across countries in this 50-year period, uh, the shape has not really changed very much. Some economists have a theory that there was sort of a disappearance of the middle, that it was sort of a polar thing where there were a lot of poor places evolving and a lot of rich places. The data don't really look like that. So just, if you look back, here, this is the current diagram. It's not like the middle is absent. That's not true. The overall shape doesn't look dramatically different. But what is true uh, is two things. One is that the mean is dramatically shifted to the right. That's because there's a lot of economic growth on average across these countries over 50 years. And secondly, the spread has uh, increased which I already referred to by looking at the difference between the richest and the poorest, but it's true in general. The dispersion across countries, if you count each country with equal weight, has increased a lot over 50 years. Uh, so those two things are, are true. Okay, now if you think about the level in 1960 per capita GDP and the level in 2009, the thing that intervenes or connects those two uh, is the growth rate between those uh, uh, two points in time, so over 49 years. So knowing the level at the beginning, the level at the end, of course, you, you know what the average growth rate is over the intervening years. Uh, so we can also look at the growth rate, uh, which is not independent, but this is what the growth rate looks like, and this is the distribution of world economic growth over this roughly 50 year uh, period. So if you look at this diagram, the high growing countries out here, uh, growing at something like four, five, six percent per capita on average for 50 years, is dominated by East Asian countries. So this includes, uh, here's Hong Kong and Singapore, this is South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, you have Malaysia and Thailand, uh, China is sort of a mixture. If you started in 1980, China would have been the fastest growing. But China didn't grow so fast from 1960 to 1980. That's why it's a mixture. That why, that's why it ends up being not quite as high as these other places in terms of growth rates. Um, India is another country, um, second largest country in the world by uh, population, uh, which has been doing quite well recently, but there was a long period where India did quite badly. Up till the mid-1980s, India did not grow rapidly, and since then, India has been growing at a pretty rapid rate. And those two observations combined to put India in this category, which is 
an average growth rate of about 3% per year over the whole period. Uh, so I had a little story uh, comparing China and India from my own uh, experiences. Uh, what I find whenever I go to China, they're particularly focused on the United States. And they want to talk about how long is it going to take, up, take us to catch up to and surpass the US. And that's kind of their orientation. Uh, when I was in India, I haven't been there nearly as often as I've been in China, uh, the focus was how come we used to be richer than China and now we're poorer than China? And what can we do to catch up to China? What can we do to have our growth performance be more like China? So somehow the US was too far away to be worrying about. Uh, so there was a contrast, at least in my individual experience, in the orientation of those two uh, uh, economies. So let me summarize what the world growth experience looks like over this roughly 50 year period. Uh, here specifically it's from 1960 to 2009. If you think about sub-Saharan Africa, that region started out relatively poor, but not so different from a lot of countries in Asia, including India and China, if you're talking about 1960. So sub-Saharan Africa was initially poor, but not dramatically poor compared with some other places. However, from 1960 to 2009, sub-Saharan Africa grew on average at the lowest rate across the various regions. So if you combine that with starting out relatively poor, then at the end, you have that sub-Saharan Africa is completely dominant in terms of where the poverty is. So it's now completely clear that if you're talking about eradicating poverty, you're basically talking about doing things uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And that would not have been the perspective in 1960. If you think about Asian countries, they started out, some of them being as poor as the African countries, some somewhat better off. They grew at the highest rate over this period. So that puts the Asian countries at the end of the sample in kind of a middle position. Some of the East Asian countries are now much richer than that. They're near the top, places like Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, South Korea, for example. If you look at Latin America, 1960 Latin American countries started out uh, roughly in the middle or upper middle income levels. Uh, a particularly striking case of that is Venezuela, which was actually very rich in 1960. It was something like the number 10 country in terms of per capita GDP. But on average in Latin America, it was somewhere in the mid-range. Latin America grew over the next 49 years at a rate that's somewhat lower than average. So they ended up again in the middle, but lower relatively speaking than where they started. Finally, you have the Rich Countries Club, the OECD, which started by far the richest in the world, grew at a rate which was about average, maybe a little better than that. So they ended up still being toward the top, but now joined by some other countries, particularly in East Asia. So that's kind of a summary of the growth experience across the world over this uh, sample. Okay, I want to try to put this a little bit in the context of uh, an economic model, uh, basically following what's usually called a neoclassical growth model, which I'm not going to go through here in a formal manner, but that would be the framework that I have in mind that I'm trying to think about to then consider something about these uh, data. Um, so this is a very quick summary of what the neoclassical growth model tells you about economic growth. Uh, so the variable little y represents real per capita GDP. Been talking about that a lot. The thing on the left here is the growth rate of that object. So that's what I was talking about in terms of average growth rates over various periods of time. Here you can think about the growth rate at a point in time, which might be a year or a five-year interval or something like that. So this is the rate of economic growth over some period. And the model says this is a function of what you can summarize in two different sorts of variables. So the first one is 
where, where are you currently at? What's your level of per capita GDP, which represents your overall level of uh, well-being or not so well-being? So here I'm summarizing that in terms of the level of real per capita gross domestic product. So that's the variable Y here. That's a, the level. This is the growth rate, and this is a level. The neoclassical growth model says, well, you start somewhere. So that would be starting with some initial level of Y. And then the model predicts you're going to grow in some fashion towards some long run or steady state value, which I'm summarizing by this thing Y star. The nature of this growth model is that the way you predominantly grow here is by accumulating physical and human capital. So you have more education, maybe better health. That's all human capital. Uh, you have more machinery. You have more buildings per worker. That's the physical capital. But the idea of this model is these kinds of activities are subject to some kind of diminishing returns. So if you start out poor, if you start out with a low Y, you tend to grow. But there are forces that make the growth rate diminish. That's what's in the, in the model. Now, if you look at this now, think about this as a simple empirical framework where I'm trying to think about what is it that determines the rate of economic growth? Well, suppose that you have a bunch of things that determine the long run or steady state position within the model. Now, in the early versions of the neoclassical growth model, which came from a paper by Bob Solow, 1956, for example, uh, two of the things that were really uh, stressed in terms of long-run factors were saving rates and population growth rates. But you can think about expanding that to a much wider range. So Solow particularly focused on these two uh, factors. Some countries, they save at a higher rate than others. Some countries have higher fertility rates or whatever, and they have different population growth rates. Those are the two things that he emphasized. You can look at a lot of other factors that influence where you're going. So one of those, particularly pertinent to the kinds of discussions we've been having here, would be aspects of the quality of governments. For example, whether there's good maintenance of property rights, rule of law, whether there's a lot of corruption. Those are all factors that are going to matter. You can think about a range of regulatory policies, some of which we've been uh, discussing. Um, you can think about whether the country is open to international trade or markets more generally. That's a big concern currently in the US in terms of whether the stance of international openness is going to change or not. Uh, you can think about the nature of institutions that affect education and health. Those are other factors that can be uh, important. So there's a whole list of things that you might think matter. And I'm going to think here of summarizing all that in terms of this Y star thing. So imagine you have some improvement in your institutions. So you didn't used to respect property rights or sanctity of contracts like we learned about noble energy uh, last night. And suppose now the government has moved to a maybe enduring stance where it's doing better in terms of property rights, rule of law, and so on. In this model, the way that'll work is it's going to raise this Y star thing. It's going to raise this target to which the economy is approaching. And that's going to mean for a given initial position, which is this Y, given current per capita GDP, if you do something that improves this long-run environment, that's going to raise the rate of economic growth on impact. That's the way the neoclassical growth model will work. Uh, in terms of what Solo emphasized, he would say if you decide you want to save at a higher rate, that would also raise this long-run position, and that will uh, impact economic growth at a point in time in a positive direction if you're saving more. And you can think about that for a whole list of variables, which you might be able to measure empirically in terms of how they're going to enter into the growth process. Now, a lot of the things that appear in this Y star tend to be persistent over time, like the nature of institutions. Some things are completely persistent, like geography, uh, climate, 
Those don't change, let's suppose, hardly at all over time for a given country. So you can think about the Y star as usually being comparatively stable, not always, but typically. And then the economy is going to grow along a path uh, as studied by the neoclassical growth model. And the nature of that path is that as you grow, for example, by accumulating human and physical capital, Y keeps rising, and that produces these forces of diminishing returns, and that tends to lower the growth rate. So that's why there's a minus sign on the Y. So what that means is if you hold fixed all this other good stuff, underlying Y star, like institutions, et cetera, and then you get richer and richer, the prediction is that your growth rate will slow down. So that kind of is what I think of as operating now for China. China has a certain set of institutions, et cetera, that govern Y star. Not the world's best, but much better than they used to be. Uh, so it's sort of approaching that, and the growth rate should be slowing down along this path unless they make further improvements, but China actually has not been making those kinds of improvements of late. So they're not then offsetting the diminishing uh, returns. Okay, now the Y effect is what's producing a convergence tendency in this model. So if you ask yourself, how would a poor country catch up to a rich one? Well, there are certain benefits from being behind, from being poor. You haven't really hit the diminishing returns. You can get the technology and ideas from the rich places. You don't have to invent stuff yourself. So there are some advantages to being poor in terms of encouraging uh, growth. And that itself is a convergence force. It tends to make poor places converge toward the richer ones. And that here would correspond to this minus sign. Minus means poor places should grow faster on that count. Now, if you think about Convergence, there are two concepts that are important in this literature. One concept is called absolute convergence. And that means you don't have to condition on all the stuff that's behind the Y star, which I gave you a list. And you just think poor places grow faster than rich ones. So that would be, for example, if all the countries had similar institutions, etc., which underlie the Y star. So they're all converging toward the same thing. And then the prediction of the model would be poor places grow faster than rich ones. That's convergence. And that's called absolute convergence. Uh, that turns out to be completely uh, in conflict with the facts. You don't see that. I'll show you that in a minute. Conditional convergence says that, well, you've got to hold fixed all this stuff, something about Y star, which is some kind of empirical challenge. But if somehow you've managed to succeed and you've held all these things constant, then conditional on that, if you're poorer, you grow faster. That's the conditional convergence. But you have to condition on a lot of stuff. I think the data are very much in line with that prediction, but not with the first one. So let me just show you some patterns in the data across countries. Um, so this is looking starting in 1960. So on the uh, horizontal axis, I have the real per capita GDP in 1960 um, for each country. Then on the vertical axis here is just the average growth rate of that country over this, this particular period was from 1960 to 2000. You could make that 1960 to 2014 or 2015. It wouldn't really look different. Uh, so this is an average growth rate over the subsequent 40 years in this particular diagram. Um, if convergence held, and in particular here, that meant that poor countries tend to grow faster than rich ones, you should see a nice negatively sloped line here. And the data don't like that at all. Basically, what the data say is that if the only thing you know about a country is how rich or poor it was in 1960, that is completely uninformative about how fast it grew over the next 40 years. So there's no absolute convergence tendency at all in these cross-country data. That's what this diagram uh, uh, shows. Um, now, to jump ahead a bit, you can think about that in the following manner. Um, 
suppose you have some country that's relatively rich in 1960. Now, the convergence idea, diminishing returns, says that country should not grow rapidly because it, it's hit a lot of diminishing returns because it's already accumulated a lot of human and physical capital. But then you can ask the question, how did this country get to be rich? How did you get to be up here in the first place? Well, the way you must have gotten to be rich in 1960 was that you were doing a lot of good things in the past that encouraged economic growth. So you must have had pretty good institutions. Maybe you had a high saving rate. Maybe you had a low fertility rate. Maybe you had good educational institutions. You must have done a lot of good things in the past. So in other words, the starting level of per capita GDP, let's say in 1960, uh, if you see that that's high, it has to be very correlated with stuff that was propelling growth in the past, which is what I tried to subsume in that Y star. So it must be that the places that are rich, if you look at it here, are places that had high Y star levels for a long time in the past because of good institutions, et cetera. And if you ask, what is the effect of the combination of things on economic growth, there are two offsetting effects there. Uh, being rich would be predicted to slow down growth because of the diminishing returns convergence property. But the fact that you're rich being reflective of things that are good for the economy, like good institutions, that works the other way. That should, have been, that should be promoting growth. And the fact that there's no relationship here, I think, is basically the offset of those two forces, why there's no absolute convergence. Um, let me look at a few other diagrams. If you look at countries that are basically more homogeneous than the whole world sample, so if I go back to this equation, suppose I look at countries that are more similar with respect to basic institutions and other traits that tell you where you're going in the long run, which is the Y star. And suppose it happens that at some date where you're looking at it initially, there's a big difference in the level of economic development represented by Y. That might be because of some previous wartime experience, for example, and you've got winners and losers. That might have created that cleavage, something like that. So if you have a group that's pretty homogeneous on Y star, but has differences in the actual GDP, then the dominant force should be the convergence one, and you should see a negative relationship. Poor place is growing faster. So what this diagram shows is that's true if you look at this rich countries club. So these are the countries that were members of this uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development at the beginning, which was 1961, actually. Um, it is true that the poorer members of that group, the ones that were poor initially, grew faster on average than the, one, than the ones that were richer. So the richest place was Switzerland, and the poor places were Portugal, Greece, Spain, and Ireland uh, in 1960. You do see this convergence pattern without conditioning on anything else if you look within that group. Uh, this is another case where you see this diagram. Um, so Xavier Sali Martin, who's now a famous economist who's uh, at Columbia University and also in Barcelona, um, he was doing his PhD thesis with me. Now it's uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, but I still remember when he came up with this diagram initially. He was studying the behavior across the U.S. states and doing it in a long-term uh, context. So this is starting uh, from 1880. And looking here at the average growth of per capita personal income across the states, those are the data that were available, uh, over 120 years from 1880 to 2000 in this particular diagram. Uh, here you see this extremely pronounced pattern where the poorer places grew faster. And this is conditioning on nothing else. Right? So there's a dramatic pattern where the poorer places grew faster and therefore were catching up to the richer ones. And similarly, the richer places were growing at a lower average rate. So the whole thing was producing a convergence kind of uh, pattern. Uh, part of this was due to the Civil War itself in the U.S. 
which made a lot of the southern states particularly poor. Those are up here. But actually, the pattern is not just the southern states catching up to the northern states. It applies throughout the range. So this is a case where you have this simple convergence pattern showing up in the data. OK, here's another uh, diagram. So this diagram goes along with this one. So this is across a broad group of over 100 countries. Uh, in this diagram, I didn't condition on anything else. I just looked at per capita GDP at the beginning, 1960, and looked at the subsequent growth rate. Now the difference here, it's basically the same sample of countries and uh, analogous time period. Uh, it's a little different because I'm looking at each country more than once. I'm looking at, uh, here I was looking at over, each country was uh, represented uh, four times because I was looking at 10 year growth intervals, but uh, that's not really critical to this. Um, the big difference between this diagram and the other one is here I'm holding constant a lot of other variables that are intended to represent that Y star attractor force. So I'm looking at things like the quality of institutions, like rule of law, property rights, some measures of that. I'm looking at things that are related to education and health, fertility. A whole bunch of variables are being held constant. And then I'm looking at the effect of per capita GDP while holding constant all these other things. So the reason this looks so different, suppose you look at a poor country here. And this says this should be growing at a rapid rate. But I'm holding constant a lot of stuff, like quality of institutions, which is systematically very related to the level of per capita GDP. So if you ask, why was it that these poor countries typically did not grow fast? So think about the sub-Saharan African countries, which started out poor and did not grow rapidly. That's the typical pattern. Well, here, that's being interpreted as, well, the reason they didn't grow fast is that their institutions were terrible, uh, educational systems were terrible, et cetera. And that's very correlated with what your level of per capita GDP was. So if you look at the actual growth, it's a combination of being poor, predicting high growth, and then all the bad effects from the things that accompany being poor. But that's held constant in this diagram. All that other stuff is held constant. This is hypothetically asking the question, suppose you were poorer, but you did not have the bad institutions that typically went along with that. Then this is saying there's a big convergence force. So there's pluses and minuses in, in this in terms of whether or not you're optimistic about poor countries developing. So the optimistic way of looking at it is to say, well, if a poor country could get its institutions in good order, and ditto for other things like health systems and education, et cetera, then it could grow rapidly and converge. The negative part of it is that it's not so easy to do those things. And it's not by accident that poor places are unable to do that. So then it's not so easy to converge. So there's two sides of the same data there. Yes? How can you hold constant all the things you, you said you did? How can you uh, presume the growth rate? Well, I'm estimating a statistical model or econometric model where the thing to be explained is per capita GDP growth. And formally, I would do that by having, let's say, 100 countries. Uh, I get more information by observing them more than once. So suppose I observe them every five years or every 10 years. Uh, so then I have quite a few data points. I have 100 countries, and each of them might be observed, say, six times between 1960 and 2010, for example. And then I have an equation I'm trying to fit. So on the right-hand side, I have a bunch of variables. One of them would be the starting level of per capita GDP. So for example, I have a first five-year interval, let's say from 1960 to 1965. I'm observing the growth rate over that period. And one of the things on the right-hand side as an explanatory factor would be the level of per capita GDP at the beginning of that interval, let's say 1960. But then I have a whole bunch of other variables. I have something about the quality of institutions. I have something about education and health. I have something about uh, uh, macroeconomic performance. So I might have 12, 13 variables. 
And then statistically, I'm fitting that equation with some econometric technique to try to explain the growth rate observed over time and across countries. So by holding constant stuff, it means I have all these other variables except for initial per capita GDP, and then I can conceptually do the experiment given I fit this model. What if I only look at per capita GDP being lower but hold constant all these other variables, which I'm able to do in this econometric sense? Um, so that's what's put on this chart. So this is uh, a way to put on two dimensions something which actually has, let's say, 13 explanatory variables. So conceptually, I'm looking at GDP per person moving, but then holding constant what's going on with all the other variables. Uh, and I'm interpreting this as a conditional convergence relationship, saying, hypothetically, if you held fixed all these factors that matter for growth, including institutions, and just made the country poorer, what would you predict? And here you get a pretty big contribution to growth from being poorer in the positive direction. Question? <coughs> yeah. Um, when looking at white stock, is there any uh, empirical evidence suggesting which institutions are most important? And if there are, um, was there any attempt to uh, export such institutions to the poorer and uh, more uh, I don't know how to say it. Yeah, the worst all so part of this is uh, limited by data. So the main results I was talking about were using some indicators of uh, maintenance of rule of law, law and order. Uh, you'd like to have data that goes back in time so that you can do this study. I wanted to start in 1960. That turns out to be too challenging in terms of the data. There are some data that start around 1980. Um, so he's using particular measures. Um, there are some different components there, and you can try conceptually to look at which things seem to be the most important. Um, so there was some indication of this property rights type rule of law variable being especially important. But as you get more and more demanding about knowing exactly which features of institutions seem to matter for growth, then your statistical reliability is really uh, going down. Uh, now, what I've been looking at recently, which was mentioned in that Wall Street Journal op-ed, uh, I've been looking at a measure of uh, ease of doing business, which comes from a project of the World Bank. Uh, so some of that looks like regulatory impact. Uh, they have 10 major components that they look at, including things like cost of opening a business, um, enforcement of contracts, uh, uh, ease of getting credit, how easy is it, it, is it to engage in international trade? Um, they have 10 indicators like that. Um, so currently we've been looking at, can we try to say something about what does regulatory climate uh, uh, contribute to economic growth? Um, I've actually, I haven't used these data before, but in terms of thinking how they were constructed and learning more about it, I'm actually pretty impressed uh, by these uh, data. I think they seem to be quite meaningful. The biggest shortcoming for this growth perspective is that these data only start in 2004, so you can't go back a lot historically. But it does look like there's a lot of explanatory power from these measures. And then along the lines of what you suggested, you can look at, well, which aspects of regulatory uh, intervention or cost of doing business seem to matter. And it's not that they all look the same. So some seem to be a lot more important than others. So I think we'll be able to come up with more answers there. This, Project to me now looks surprisingly promising, so I think we might get some results there. Um, there's one funny story about that that I don't know you might be interested in. They used to have an indicator called uh, labor market regulation, uh, which had to do with uh, how easy is it particularly to hire and fire workers, and what do you have to do when you fire somebody in terms of severance pay. So they had a number of measures that looked quite good in terms of measuring the uh, fluidity of the labor market. And then the World Bank got all these objections uh, from labor unions and from the International Labor Organization about why do you have this indicator here? Makes it look like it's a good thing to be able to fire workers easily. And they had this big political fight uh, over what to do. Uh, basically, they wanted to get rid of the whole project. 
and they ended up with a political compromise where they took this labor indicator out of their main set of indicators. So they have these 10 indicators in terms of categories now. Uh, they used to have this other one, which would be number 11. Uh, they still generate the data, but they don't include it in their main indicator anymore. Uh, more recently, China wanted also to get rid of the whole project because they didn't think that China was rated high enough in terms of these various indicators of regulatory uh, interference. And then they had another big fight. And uh, finally, uh, they had a, a, an outside group that provided advice to the World Bank. And the World Bank uh, Board of Directors was actually quite good in this context. And they refused to give in to the Chinese. And they said, we think this is a very valuable project and we're not going to stop it. And then actually the Chinese lost interest. I think that they, their indicators improved some and then they uh, uh, retracted their opposition. So they uh, also got past that. Uh, so I think uh, it might be that we can do more here. Now the World Bank people think that their indicators actually do have influence of the sort that you mentioned. They think that th these indicators are getting a lot of attention from various ministries and uh, they're doing this in 190 countries now. They think they're actually having influence on the practice about costs of doing business that are being followed by other countries. I don't know whether that's true or not, but the World Bank thinks that they're actually doing this. And, you know, I typically have not had such a high opinion of the World Bank and how it influences economic development, but I think this project actually looks quite good and we're hoping to use it a lot more. Um, I'm not sure how far I should go here. Um, let me give you quickly this uh, definition of convergence success stories, which you might be interested in. Uh, this is a definition that's somewhat arbitrary, but it seems to be quite effective in terms of what it uh, produces. Uh, there's often this question about wh where are the convergence success stories in the world? Which countries can you name which over some period, maybe 20, 40 years, managed to converge from being poor to being much richer, uh, middle income, upper income, and so on. Um, so this was a particular definition I adopted. It applies since 1990. So I looked at the countries that have grown at least 3% per year per capita uh, from 1990 until 2014. So keep in mind the average per capita growth rate across this whole sample is about 2% per capita. So 3% is substantially above that average. All right, so I looked at countries that managed to sustain that for a period of 24 years and which also achieved a certain level that you would think about as being either middle or upper income. Um, so I thought about middle income as being real per capita GDP of 10,000 uh, and upper as 20,000. So if you look at that list of countries that have achieved these criteria, this is what they look like. Uh, so these are the group you would think about as high income successes, convergence success stories. Uh, so it includes some of the champion countries that people often uh, think about, uh, like the East Asian countries, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia. Uh, Chile is the big success story in uh, Latin America, which has sustained high economic growth now for a long time. So it's now uh, actually in the high income group uh, Ireland is a little different. It started off pretty rich, but then it grew extremely rapidly, so it still satisfied the criteria that I had just uh, uh, presented. Uh, and Israel is almost uh, in that group. Uh, didn't grow quite at 3% per year per capita over that period, but it was close. Uh, and this is the middle income group, so this includes China. Um, and then it includes a number of other countries. Peru has basically been following in the footsteps of Chile uh, in South America and has been very successful now for the uh, last couple of decades. Um, uh, anyway, uh, there's this concept called the middle income trap, which uh, the World Bank was particularly pushing. So the idea there is that somehow you can manage to get to the middle group, but it's extremely hard to go from there to the middle to the upper income group. Uh, and actually, I think that's completely false. I don't think there's any evidence for that, even though the World Bank likes that concept. Uh, in particular, I think it's just as hard to get into this group as to advance from this group to the upper income group. So I don't think there's anything special about this middle income uh, trap. Um, so I wanted to talk about this important work from uh, Sally Martin, who I already mentioned uh, once before. 
in terms of looking at world income distribution. So this paper now is about uh, 10 years old and it's had a lot of follow-on research uh, uh, related to it. Um, so this relates to this property that I focused on before. I mentioned if you look across countries, the dispersion of per capita GDP increased a lot over 50 years. But that's at the level of countries. And if you want to think about income distribution, if you want to think about poverty, you really want to think about people, not about countries. And if you think about starting with countries, then you want to give a lot more weight to the countries that have more people. And very dominantly, the countries with the most people are China and India, which together are something like 35, 40% of world population. So what turns out to be true is that even though there's been a widening in the spread across countries and per capita GDP, if you look at some estimate across people, the conclusion seems to be the opposite. And that's particularly because China and India have been doing so well recently. China since uh, late 1970s, India since the uh, mid-1980s. And the very rapid economic growth in those two places over those two periods means that a lot of people have been moved out of poverty into something more like middle class. And that actually dominates the world pattern if you want to look at world income distribution or world poverty numbers. And that's what Xavier showed in his paper from 10 years ago, and then there's been a lot of follow-on work related to this. So let me quickly sketch uh, the basic idea of what he did. Uh, so this is a particular year, which let's say is 1970. That's the first year where he was able to assemble enough data to do his exercise. Uh, so here we are in 1970, and I'm looking at real per capita income uh, on the horizontal axis on some kind of proportionate scale. And I'm going to do this now for every country in the world conceptually. So think about China, for example. Here's China in 1970. Um, so there were two things, basically, that Xavier knew about China in 1970. First off, he knew some kind of average income. So for example, you can get that from the national income and product account. So we had some measures of per capita real GDP, and that's the number he was using to gauge some kind of average income in China at a particular date, which here is 1970. So there's a big controversy here. Should you really be using the national accounts data, here represented by the gross domestic product, or should you be using some numbers that come out of like household income surveys? And I'm not really going to be able to get into that debate here, uh, but Xavier does have a later paper where he purports to demonstrate that it's actually much more accurate to use the national accounts data rather than the income survey data. But there is an ongoing controversy about that. So anyway, if you take China, 1970, the mean of income in that year is going to be um, disciplined by what we know from the national accounts in terms of per capita income or product. So that's going to fix the average level. And then the other thing Xavier has is measures of the dispersion of income or income inequality within countries at a given point in time. So in 1970, he has some information about quantiles or deciles of income within China, some measures of inequality. So he basically puts together the mean that he gets from the national accounts with a measure of dispersion, and that comes from household survey type information. That's where he gets the inequality number uh, or, or, or shape within a country. So combining what he knows about the per capita GDP with the distribution for China, he estimates the whole distribution of Chinese per capita income in a particular year, which here is 1970. Um, so if you look at the peak in that curve, that's corresponding to the mean. That comes from the national account data. And then there's some dispersion or inequality within China in that day, which comes from the household survey information about inequality for China. And so is that clear, kind of conceptually, what he does, I guess? Um, so then the idea is to do that for every country. So India, the countries you can see on this graph are the ones with big populations. 
Otherwise, it all gets folded into this stuff here, right? The big population countries are what really show up in terms of people. So India is the second biggest country. So he does the same thing for India in 1970. He has a measure of per capita GDP for India, and then he has household survey information which tells you about inequality uh, of income within India uh, here in 1970. And from that, he estimates the whole distribution for India per capita income in 1970. So if you compare India and China, the means here are actually about the same. If you look at 1960, India would have been noticeably richer than China. But this is 1970. So the means are actually the same. And according to these estimates, inequality at that point in time was actually greater in India than in China. That is, this curve was more spread out than the Chinese one. But this is in 1970, back uh, you know, more than 40 years ago. Okay. All right, so conceptually he does that for every country. And sometimes he doesn't have all the good information about household surveys telling him about inequality, so he has to make some kinds of approximations. But to the extent he can do it by knowing the mean from the per capita GDP and the dispersion from the household surveys, he constructs these curves for every country in the world. So you can see here, here is the United States way out to the right because its average per capita income is quite high. Uh, you can look at the spread. So there's been a lot made about inequality within the United States going up over time. And that'll show up in terms of what the US curve looks like at different points in time. Uh, you can see Japan, you can see the former Soviet Union, and, and so on. Uh, but underlying all of this uh, is 100 plus countries, and you just can't see them all. Down here is particularly going to be a lot of sub-Saharan African countries, of which the largest is Nigeria, and that'll be particularly important in terms of the low end of it. If you really had this for every country, then if you look at every income level, or a little slice there, some kind of vertical bar, you can ask how many people in the world have a given level of per capita income, real per capita income in 1970. So that just comes from adding up across all the countries vertically. Right? So uh, if you look at a particular income level, here are all the Indians with that level, here are all the Chinese, then there are all these other countries that you can't see, you add them all up vertically. And then you get this uh, pinkish diagram, and that's supposed to be uh, the world distribution of income per person in 1970. That's his estimate of it. Of it. Right, so that, that's, this is now people, this is not countries. Because right, the way it's constructed, the big countries are weighted by population because this is how many people in China have each income level. And that then contributes to the world uh, distribution. This here? The mean, the mean is going to be, the mean is, it's going to be over here somewhere. So this vertical line here, he's trying to do two things uh, at a point in time or over time. He's trying to think about income inequality, how it evolves over time in the world or for given countries. He's also trying to look at some concept of poverty. So intrinsically, poverty. Uh, should be some absolute con con uh, concept. You know, in terms of about having enough quote unquote food, clothing, shelter, etc. So that should be some amount of real income. And the fact that some other country is richer or poorer shouldn't influence that. Or the fact that the world gets richer or poorer over time maybe shouldn't change your concept about what it means to be in, let's say, extreme poverty. Um, so this is a line which comes from the uh, the United Nations, actually. Uh, they had this famous $1 a day concept they used to think of as being in extreme poverty. But that was dollars based back in 1980 or something or other. So this is basically how much income you needed to be above that poverty line, but updated uh, for inflation that occurred uh, over the relevant period. Uh, so I think this was actually something like 500 something dollars per year in real terms. Uh, rather than actually literally $1 a day. But it comes from this famous $1 a day poverty line concept. 
Um, so this is some kind of vertical bar. You might not like the positioning. Maybe you think $1 a day isn't enough. So Chavier looked at what he called extreme poverty, which is this, and then at some other line, which is higher, some other concept of uh, less extreme poverty. Yes? But in the OCD, it was hard to know Yeah, they keep adjusting the concept, which means it's more a measure of inequality than it is a measure of poverty. So what Chavez looked at was two things. Poverty he thought of as an absolute concept in terms of real income. Then he also looked at inequality. Inequality is a relative concept. How much do you have relative to other people in your country or in the world? So he looked at both of those things. So the way they do poverty lines in the U.S. is really more like inequality, I would say. Uh, rather than some absolute concept of poverty. So it's sort of a moving target in that sense. Um, okay, so if you, if you look at this vertical line and you look to the left of it, then you can compute from this diagram how many people were below the poverty line. That's the, basically the area of, the, of this pink curve to the left of the vertical line. So you can do that either in absolute numbers, absolute poverty numbers, or you can do it relative to world population, which would be a relative concept. So you can do both of those things here. And inequality in the world would have to do with the overall shape of this curve, some kind of measure of dispersion. And there are alternative measures of dispersion that you can use to compute some inequality type measure. And you can do that once, once you have this curve constructed, you can do that kind of thing. Right. Okay, then he did a comparison over time. And here I'm looking at the year 2000. You could look at any year. Initially he did it at 10 year intervals. I think he's updated this now, but uh, this is the year 2000. Uh, so this is 30 years before, this is the year 2000. The uh, question is, what's changed over the 30 years? Uh, so it's interesting to look at individual countries. Uh, again, you can see the big countries. So here's China, and then here's China estimated 30 years later. So there are two th big things that happened. Yes? Is the dollar per day inflation adjusted in 2000? Yeah, it's the same real concept. It's a real income concept. I don't see a shift to the right. Well, it shouldn't shift to the right because this is all, this is all real income. Uh, the, the, the horizontal axis is real per capita income. I forget in what base here, but it's, it's a real concept. So the vertical line should not be moving. Okay, so here's China in 2000, estimated by Xavier. Two big differences from 30 years earlier. Um, China, again, is one of the world's highest growing countries over that period, particularly since 1980, but even since 1970. That corresponds to a big rightward shift of this whole curve. Just the typical person got richer in China by a lot. The second thing that happened with China is that income inequality went up a lot within China. And this is well known in China. Some of that is rural urban. Some of that is that people being more involved in kind of the high-tech, fast-growing sectors in China rather than the laggards. So those effects meant that some people benefited disproportionately from the incredible economic growth in China. So the average person benefited, even if they stayed in agriculture, but some people benefited disproportionately. So that's uh, the widening of the distribution within China. You can see that that's a lot different from here. So how you think about the growing inequality in China obviously has two dimensions. One is uh, inequality is higher than it used to be within China. But if you think about it from a world perspective, what is this contributing to this world distribution of income, which is the pink stuff? You're actually taking a lot of people from the lower part of the distribution and moving them up. That's what China's doing. So from a world perspective, it's actually decreasing inequality. It's dramatically reducing the poverty numbers, which are the people to the left of the vertical line. But even for inequality, it's actually uh, reducing world inequality at the same time that it's raising within country inequality for China. 
Uh, so you can compare India, which uh, of course Indian people didn't like the fact that they didn't do as well as China in some sense. Uh, so here's India in 1970, and this is India in 2000. So India has also moved a lot to the right because of the strong economic growth, not as much as China, but uh, a lot. Uh, inequality within India did not change that much over this period. So now India is actually more evenly distributed than China, which was not true by these estimates in 1970. Um, of course, China and India together are com contributing dramatically toward lower poverty, both absolute and relative poverty numbers, and also to reduced inequality. To, there's less uh, uh, dispersion across people's income in the world than there was uh, uh, before. Uh, in fact, if you look at the poverty numbers, so you can see India and China, how much is the population is to the left of the vertical line. Uh, you're talking here about moving 400, 500 million people out of poverty because uh, these countries are, uh, China is over a billion uh, people and India is around a billion. Uh, and there's a dramatic movement uh, from below the poverty line to above it. Uh, this is probably the biggest welfare achievement in human history, I think, is the economic growth accomplishments of these two countries and what it means to poor people. And that's all despite the fact that inequality in China went up. Not in India, but in China. But uh, if what you really care about is absolute standards of living, it's a tremendous accomplishment for both of those uh, uh, countries. Um, Again, you can see some other countries here. You can see Nigeria. This is the largest country in Africa. Um, it's dominantly true here, which is related to my previous discussion about world economic growth, that poverty is almost exclusively now a sub-Saharan African problem. Uh, not true in 1970, but in, 19, in 2000, uh, the lion's share of people in poverty is sub-Saharan Africa, and that wasn't true uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Well, Xavier looked at several measures of dispersion in his article. This is in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, 2006 or something, 2005, or something. I forget, it. something like that. Um, he considered alternative measures. Um, there are some familiar measures that are used. He got a similar kind of story uh, about what happened to inequality based on alternative measures. Um, but with some measures, you can get world inequality having increased and some having decreased. It's not a dramatic change in terms of the way you typically measure dispersion across persons in the world. Uh, the thing that is dramatic is the poverty reduction numbers, this absolute standard, which, as you say, uh, is not the way to compute poverty numbers uh, in the U.S. and other rich countries. Um, so you can see, again, these other countries. So the U.S. is out here. It is true that the dispersion in the U.S. went up. Um, it's kind of trivial relative to the whole picture. And it's also true that ba basically nobody in the U.S. is below the poverty line. As a first approximation, uh, it's zero. Um, of course, that's this fixed poverty line, which is a much lower standard that would be applied in the U.S. You wouldn't be doing $500 in real terms per person in the U.S. You'd have a much higher standard of what you consider the poverty line, which is not what this is. Um, uh, so this is the former Soviet Union. You can see that one uh, and so on. Um, so this, I think, is quite important work. There's some complementary work that Xavier did with a, a co-author that came out uh, a couple years ago in the Quarterly Journal of Economics that looks at this question that I uh, alluded to briefly, which was about should you really be using the national accounts data to try to give you the mean of per capita income, or should you be using something different? And he has an interesting approach to considering that uh, uh, problem. Uh, he uses, there are these data on lights. There are these satellite data now that come from light intensity at night across the globe. Uh, with those data, you can get some measure of economic activity at small uh, geographical ranges, not just for countries. Uh, you can look at how it changed over time, at least over a 20-year uh, period. Uh, it's not good for the rich countries. 
there's too much sort of truncating at the top, so it's not going to tell you the difference between the U.S. and Switzerland. But for poorer countries, it seems to be quite a good indicator of economic progress. So they use those data, particularly for this question about should you be using the national accounts data or should you be using these uh, household survey data to get some idea about what average income is. And they have a clever way of doing that, which I think is kind of informative. Uh, so I think that's all I plan to say. Russ? I, I just wanted to ask you to reconcile what seems to be two different perspectives. You had that picture of uh, your condition of rule of law and other factors and showed that there was some convergence. And another way to interpret that is there's that one, uh, back one, that one. That those matter a lot. Like you said, you might interpret it as either convergence or they start poor because they have bad institutions and then they manage to unfortunately stay poor if they have good institutions, excuse me, other way around. They have bad institutions, yeah, they stay poor. They have good institutions, they just happen to be poor at the beginning, they're going to eventually catch up, there'll be some convergence. But then your picture of the United States, like, to us, at least as United States citizens, there's been a wide range of policy regimes over the last 80 years. High taxes, low taxes, regulatory reform, deregulation of the, the Carter years going forward, the Reagan years. And yet, until recently, they didn't see, it doesn't seem to matter, at least in the raw data. You just get 2% per capita growth every year, right? <laughs> so how do you reconcile those two stories? And should I really care that Trump reads your editorial? I mean, I, I happen to like your editorial. I agree with you. I'd love to see Trump somehow manage to be less regulatory and avoid a trade war. But it's some, the, evidence, the raw evidence seemingly is not so strong. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, don't you think on the first order that the U.S. put in some very positive institutions a long time ago? Yeah. And that the basics of that have been in place and have been there for a long time? And that that might be the dominant thing? And the stability there might relate to the stability in growth? So we have some effects that look like changes in policy. And in some paper, I did estimate what's the effect of changing uh, average marginal tax rates, for example, or doing something with government expenditure and mm -hmm. so on. But it, I don't find it that surprising that those things would be secondary late, relative to the basics that seem to have been in place for quite a while. And more broadly, I think of the Y star stuff in the context of the countries as being the stuff that typically doesn't change that much uh, in short periods of time, that it's much more stable than other things. And that's why it's meaningful to think about convergence to something which is on the first order a relatively fixed target. Not completely fixed, it certainly changes with regi regime changes. But I tend to think about that as being more persistent, uh, and the U.S. is probably more persistent than most places in terms of the basic institutions. Um, it just say, I, I agree with you. I mean, it just suggests to me we ought to be really careful about those big things, at least in the United States, and maybe argue less about the marginal things. But that's, I don't so, know. You know, I haven't heard anything from Trump, I'm afraid. I have to admit that. But I do. there's a change in terms of my colleagues at Harvard and how they view me in terms of uh, uh, economic outlook and uh, potential as an advisor. Because I think the typical member of my department, uh, including the macro people, would have said that they don't really like the way I look at macroeconomic policy and they wouldn't have wanted me to be a government advisor and things like that. But since Trump uh, got elected, the whole view changed. Then the idea was, uh, well, I might be a little bit out there, but relatively speaking to Trump, they would like it if I were his advisor and it <laughs> would make him kind of more normal and reasonable. So, so in that sense, the esteem in which I'm held by my colleagues has gone up, at least in some relative sense. <laughs> yeah. One more question. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, one more. It's Two. fine. Two. Okay. Two. Okay. Two. Yeah. Two. So, uh, my question would be: um, In your last graph, uh, you showed that um, inequality has risen uh, more in China than in India. And at the same time, the inequality reason somewhat uh, in the U.S. Now, it seems um, that 
uh, a higher inequality is probably something that caused the, the, the increasing polarization in the US, although I don't, I'm not sure we can establish as a causal link, uh, but, in, but there's, there's definitely a cleavage between uh, right wing and left wing, or I don't know how to call it, and now that Trump is in, uh, in control as president. So I, I'm wondering, it might be more a sociological point, but do you know if a relative to, um, to India has the, the inequality uh, rise in China made for a more um, polarized society there too? I'm not sure I buy your story for the US. I mean, the pattern in the US is that the increases in income inequality started sometime in the 1970s, mid-1970s. Before that, there was a long period of declining inequality. Uh, since the 1970s, it's been rising, um, which kind of reflects things like returns to human capital, particularly college education versus high school, more skill versus less skill. Uh, anything that you're good at seems to matter more than it used to. And, but that's a, a pattern that was in place from the mid-1970s, at least up to the Great Recession, uh, say 2008. So to say that that's what caused the polarization, I don't know if the timing uh, is right. And I don't know if you want to look at the level of inequality or how much it's rising. Um, because the fact that it's been increasing is something that was true for 30 years or more. And I think in terms of income inequality, that the rise that was true through 2008 or so hasn't so much been in place since then. Uh, actually, a lot of rich people did badly during the Great Recession. Um, I, wealth inequality and income inequality also do look different. And I don't know if you think wealth inequality is a bigger deal for polarization than income inequality. So that's another issue that's uh, there. But, I mean, it might be true that the uh, fact that inequality is much higher than it was, uh, say, in 1970 is an important factor, but I don't think it's really been uh, uh, demonstrated. I mean, China has a lot of tensions, uh, some of it on the uh, rural-urban margin, uh, which they seem to be making progress on for a while, particularly in terms of making it easier for people to move to big cities and be able to use educational systems in big cities and things like that. that that's stuff that matters a lot for inequality. But then I, I think they've stopped making progress along those lines, so uh, I'm not sure. Do I stop? There's always one more. This one is really the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you mentioned the two percent a lot, and you said you don't think it has a special meaning, but it does come up. Like, why two percent? Because it's also in Israel, it's also two percent over a long time, a period of time. And, uh, does it have anything to do with like the population growth or? Well, the 2% number I referred to before was about average growth rate of per capita GDP. So, yeah, so it, why oh, I don't think I have a good answer for that. But this first came up in a different context. It's a different 2%. Uh, there's another thing here, which is how fast do you converge? Let's say in terms of the conditional convergence, how fast is the rate of convergence? That was what I estimated to be 2% per year a long time ago in the work initially in the 1990s. Um, so Larry Summers dubbed that the iron law of convergence, which was that you converge at 2% per year toward the target, uh, which could be in a conditional or an absolute sense. So I thought that was a wonderful terminology. So conceptually in terms of the model, could think about what forces would determine quantitatively the rate of convergence. But the fact that it's 2% per year, I mean, that was a possibility, but it certainly wasn't something you would know a priori. And then moreover, I would not have a good analysis of why the long run per capita growth rate turned out to average 2%. That seems to be something completely different from the convergence rate, which is where this iron law rate of 2% was first mentioned in the literature. Um, 
Actually, it was funny. I first heard this iron law thing from Rudy Dornbush. And at some point, I happened to mention it to Larry Summers that Rudy had said this was the iron law of convergence. And Larry got really indignant that he said, oh, I invented that name, and Rudy got it from me. But I mean, I thought it was a good terminology. But I, I don't know why the long run growth rate is 2% per year. I mean, it looks like now it may have slowed down to something more like 1% per capita. But that would be only based on measurements since roughly 2000, where the growth rate seems lower not only in the US, but in the other uh, rich countries. Uh, and then people are coming up with a lot of stories about why the long run growth rate may have gone down. I haven't really discussed that, but people talk about things like technological progress and entrepreneurship and other factors that determine the long run rate of growth, which was sort of in the background of the things I was describing. I didn't really talk about that in, uh, analysis. Um, so I look forward to your coming up with an analysis that produces 2% as the predicted long run per capita growth rate. That would be great. Okay.